Um, so we're going to do a little thing on boiler water chemistry. Um, as some of you may know, before becoming a trainer, I came out of technical support. Um, I spent four years in tech support. Prior to that, I spent 32 plus years uh, running my own business, and I have a total of about 40 years in the trade. Water chemistry is big, um, but it's not big. It's not well known in the U.S. Um, so what is it? What's water chemistry? What does it do for us? Right? How does it affect our heating systems? Um, it affects efficiency. It affects corrosion. It affects the longevity of a boiler. It affects how well we can move fluid through that system to transfer that into heat in the house. Um, in the U.S., we don't seem to pay as much attention to it as we do as they do in Europe. In Europe, it's mandatory, period, and you have to be certified in order to do it. So we're a little behind, but I think we can catch up, and that's hopefully what I'm going to give you today. Some of the ins and outs, the basics. There's no way that I can teach you all about water chemistry in in an hour. This is just just impossible. But if I can get you in the in the path to be able to find this for yourselves and to be able to learn it, it's it's a pretty cool subject when you come right down to it, or a hot subject. So let's go. So what's a closed system? Closed system is sealed off from the atmosphere. It circulates the same water. So it seems logical then that we don't need any water treatment, right? Uh, wrong. We need water treatment of some sort be it chemical, um, be it through pressures, be it through starting with a perfect system with perfect water in it, we need to maintain that. There's no such thing as a perfect closed loop. Um, anything that, that does hot water, heating, cooling, um, recirculation requires some sort of assistance or treatment to prevent scale, build up corrosion and to keep efficiencies up. If we try to define a true closed loop system, it's one that loses less than 1% of the fluid it holds in a month. So a 500 gallon system, that's five gallons in a month, 10,000 gallons, that's 100 gallons a month, that's a lot. Residentially, we're dealing with small stuff. So we're not dealing with these big numbers losing 100 gallons, 30 gallons, kind of the average residential system yeah there's a lot bigger there are some smaller we got a green star boiler it's 0.8 or 0.9 gallons capacity in the boiler itself and then we look at piping so if we have short loops um, small loops piping basic systems we don't have very much so a loss of one percent is 0.3 gallons per month to be considered a true closed loop system other than that, it's actually going to be considered an open recirc loop. And that's considered that for the purpose of what we do with water treatment. If we can truly be closed and never add water to that system, we can scavenge oxygen. We can treat it pH-wise so that we'll maintain that. All right, so the effects of a closed loop system for any kind of heating or cooling, cooling are the same. We have corrosion, we have deterioration of components, loss of heat transfer efficiency. Why? What causes it? How does that happen? How can it possibly happen? We put clean water in a, in a new system. Well, when we fill a closed loop, we can fill it with either acidic or alkaline water. It's going to contain dissolved oxygen unless we have some way to take that dissolved oxygen out through temperature pressure. And that can be done our fill water, if we were to take our fill water heated to 220 degrees, put 30 pounds of pressure on it, we can pretty much squeeze all of that dissolved oxygen out of that water if we can get it in the system without letting any oxygen back in, then yeah, that part works. So the consideration would be that a water source, an, a, a fill water, with perfect pH, um, perfect chemical makeup, and no dissolved oxygen, we can leave this thing alone. We we'll have to treat it. It simply doesn't happen. 
So anytime we have dissolved oxygen, minerals, other stuff, mild steel, copper, brass, even stainless will corrode pretty rapidly. Um, we've actually seen boilers that are a year or two old in very, very bad water conditions that have pinholes in them already. So when we replace a boiler under warranty because it's got a pinhole in it and it's a year old, and in another year or another six months, we have the same boiler, the same block, whatever we've replaced doing the same thing, we have a problem. And you're not going to see any warranty stuff if we have a water chemistry issue. So most of these loops, they're not truly closed. We have provisions for automatically compensating for, for pressure changes. We lose a little pressure. Um, we heat water. We expand it as we bring that water back down to cold. It contracts. We might add a little bit more. So we have an expansion tank. We have a relief valve. And usually, in most cases, we have a, a pressure-reducing valve connecting us right to a water main, whatever that happens to be, public source, private source. Some public water systems are fantastic. They got great water, no issues, no problems chemically, but they all have dissolved oxygen. So that's the key to this whole thing is that dissolved oxygen and correct pH. So this is the most important parts of treating our water. Um, expansion tanks, they've got a volume of air trapped above the, the water, whether they have a bladder type tank, whether they have a direct um, standard air to water tank that we used to use quite a bit. That oxygen can actually get through the rubber membrane of the bladder in the tank and it will come out into the water. It circulates throughout the system. As we heat it, those little bubbles get big. We get noise, we get corrosion, Oxi um, oxidation. Okay, So anytime we have oxidation, we have problems. Um, as we bleed air from a loop, we have a little bit of a leak. We bring in a fresh supply of that dissolved oxygen and put it into our water. We got to get rid of that or we got to maintain it so we don't have to constantly look at that. Properly maintained, we're okay. We can have some pretty substantial leaks undetected. You got a radiant system and you got a leak that's leaking a quarter to a day. Um, which isn't a lot of water, by the way. That's a, that's a slow, slow drip um, under a concrete slab. You won't see that. And you won't see it unless you start doing some testing on it. So it's going to start making up water. It's going to dilute whatever chemicals we may put in. We have to make sure that our system is tight and stays tight. So periodic testing, maybe on a yearly basis, we look at what our water chemistry is. If it's changed from last year, and I treated it last year, I'm gonna look at why all of a sudden there's no treatment left in this thing. So is that the, the case for we have a leak, I have makeup water going in there at a half gallon or a gallon a day um, and diluting what I have. So simple ways to see what's going on. How do we know whether a system's got problems or not? There's some pretty simple ways to look at this to give a, an indication that there might be a problem. Look at the water. Use your those two tools in the middle of your head, um, your eyes. All right. Use your nose. That's the, it. Shouldn't smell bad. Good, clean, properly treated boiler water should be pretty neutral. Um, you might even have a little bit of the chemical smell if we're using um, a a chemical in that for an inhibitor. Um, but the color and the clarity, if you're, if you're pulling out water and 99% of the systems I see or have seen out in the, in the world, um, dark brown and black water with some odor is pretty normal. Um, a lot of solids at the bottom of a bucket when you, when you collect that out of there. If you start seeing that and you've got some issues with water, we need to take care of them. So there should be a filter on the system. And I am a proponent of, of a multi-type filter. It's a magnetic separator as well as a filter. It's going to take out some of those solids. It's going to take out any magnetite that might be in that system. So an iron-based um, contaminant. They're super fine. A lot of times that's what we see, black water in the system. It's a dissolved magnetite. If we can pick that up with a strong magnet, it takes it out of that system. It helps to clean things up. We're going to talk a little bit more about filters as I go a little bit further through this thing. Um, 
but I want to kind of touch on testing and what what are we looking for? What What's water supposed to be? So these are the minimum test parameters that we at Bosch look for if we're looking for a test. We have a problem. We've had, uh, let's say we've had three heat exchangers change or even two, and we're calling for a water test in order to gain warranty on a leaking boiler. These are the things that we want to see. So you're going to send out a test to an independent lab. Um, Romar has one, Fernox has one. There's a thousand of them around the country in private labs. You're going to test for pH, alkalinity, total hardness, chlorides, conductivity, sulfates, the percentage of glycol that might be in there or not, um, what the freeze temperature might be, dissolved metals, we're looking for aluminum, copper, iron, and we're looking for inhibitors, what's there? So what do we already have in the system? What don't we have in the system? So when that goes out and we find a pH of 6.1, 5.8, or a pH of 10, we've got a problem and we're gonna corrode that boiler through a, a pH problem, either an alkaline or an acid. It's eating, the boiler is gonna eat the system, it eats pumps, it eats pretty much everything. Um, chlorides are another thing that are extremely aggressive. Chlorides are sodium chloride, calcium chloride, that type of thing. Um, the biggest cause of sodium chloride or chlorides, um, contaminants in a well system from road salt. Uh, I'm here in New Hampshire and we see a lot of it. Actually, the state of New Hampshire has a program. If your well has been contaminated by road salt um, by the state, they do some testing, they figure it out. The state will actually drill a new well for you. Those are the things that are going to eat aluminum, stainless, all of the materials that we're going to use for, for our heating system. Those are the things we have to watch out for and take out of that equation. If we can treat it, the water coming in becomes less of an issue, right? Because we treat in that system. We're only going to treat our closed loop system once we have it tightened up and closed. So just kind of a, a universal test kit. Fernox makes one, Romar makes one. Um, we use Fernox a lot and we recommend Fernox with our boilers on our Green Star line, actually all of our lines. Um, so I'm kind of leaning on Fernox a little bit here to, to help me with some information and get this across. These kits are reasonably inexpensive. Um, they work well and most anybody can run them. You got some test strips for pH. Um, you got total hardness. There's a few other things in there. One will test for chlorides. Um, conductivity, that type of thing. Uh, anybody that's not familiar with the pH scale and you kind of look, you, you, the pH scale looks at whether it's an acid or a base or an alkaline. Um, greater than seven, it's basic, it's alkaline. pH scale below seven starts to be an acid. So it's a logarithmic scale. Each pH value, each whole value, below seven, 10 times more acidic than the next higher one. So if we start with a pH of four, it's 10 times more acidic than, than five and 100 times more than six. It is 1,000 times more acidic than seven. So let's think about that for a minute. We go down to four, it doesn't sound like a big jump. It's 1,000 times more acidic more corrosive it's going to eat things a thousand times faster so point in that so we go by points it'll be seven two seven four seven six that type of thing those count and, the, and again ten times for each one this just gives me kind of a little it's kind of a chart that shows what phs are so we get household cleaners ammonias that type of thing we're in the 12 region Pure water, right at seven. Milk, a little bit a little bit more acidic, blood a little less acidic. Those are the things we want in the boiler. Actually, we only want the water in there. Um, we don't want water, vinegar, lemon juice, even stomach acid at two. All right, so hydrochloric acid is, is a zero. Um, 
just as acidic as we can get. That's the for pH. So we start looking at pH. That's one thing we look at here. We have several. We have hard water. And that hard water, calcium, magnesium, um, those minerals, when heated, they're going to stick right to whatever they're heated with. So when we go over a certain temperature, usually around 130 or 140 degrees, we start to take those minerals out of suspension. We turn them into a solid. They stick to the hottest part. So it's going to be all of the surfaces of the boiler. They're going to stick to that. And we're going to see this white crusty layer. Um, so what does it do to our heating system? That white crusty layer of lime scale, um, magnesium, whatever it happens to be, calcium, lime, magnesium, um, all hardness or all scale. It's 100 times less thermally conductive than steel is. So it's a really, really thin layer. And I've got a little chart coming up in a while. That little thin layer starts messing with the efficiency. How well can I transfer the heat that I'm making on the fire side of my boiler through the metal and into the water? So if I've got a half inch of lime scale in there, our new boilers, we won't be able to move any water. Right, because our passages aren't a half inch in most of them. But a half inch is about a 70% drop in efficiency. 70%, think about that, you use a thousand gallons, 700 gallons is gonna go to waste. All right, that's big. So part of that is, is the importance of taking care of all of this at once. It's not hard to do. This is a plate heat exchanger. It's a raised plate heat exchanger. You can see on each side, the in and the out. Um, they're not very, the passages aren't very thick in there. We get a 32nd of an inch of lime scale, magnesium, whatever it happens to be. The efficiency of that plate of heat exchanger goes away very, very quickly. Um, next one, that happens to be a tube from a GB162 Bedaris boiler. It's got a twist and turn on the inside that moves what when we move water across it we're turning it all the time we're getting great heat transfer out of that those passages are relatively small and if we fill them up we don't get any heat transfer across there then we've got a boiler that will overheat will not transfer the heat to your house and the efficiencies are, are atrocious um, piece of pipe with some scale in it this is hard water scale the longer it goes the more it builds up you can see on the end of those pipes the different layers they just keep going. All right, here's another example of that whole conductivity, the whole hardness thing. All right, so magnesium silicate, um, calcium chloride, uh, calcium uh, lime, that type of thing. We're going to form those scales. We're going to have a hard time with that. Um, again, goes back to what do we do for efficiency and how does this work? Can we clean it up? Yeah, chemically, we can clean this up pretty easily. First thing we're going to do is we're going to take care of oxygen. Second thing we're going to do is we're going to take care of our pH. And third, we're going to take care of the minerals and the other stuff that are in there. This is a Green Star block or heat exchanger block from a Green Star boiler. This was in our test bench um, not too long ago. I determined today that it's no longer existing. Um, but our uh, test guys took this one apart because it came back. It, we couldn't get rid of the heat in it. The stack temps were super high, it kept going to limit, and we could move barely any water through it. I actually think I'm taking the call on this um, a couple of years ago on the tech line. Not so good. So you can see where this has been cut open, the effects or how much debris there is on that heat exchanger. You can also see how corroded it is, how rough that is inside. It didn't start out that that's super rough inside. And that's a little eight by 12 bucket. There's not a ton of it there, but this was just what we dumped out of that one hole. All right. So that's a Green Star boil. That's an actual, we did it in-house. Um, we gave him a new heat exchanger. We gave him a new block, but we're not gonna get a second one unless we fix the water. So the big reasons for fixing water are efficiency, 
efficiency and longevity. So we have three reasons. Both of them are efficiency, and then the third one is longevity. So what's actually corrosion? What's corrosion? If we look at that, this other pick back here, this corrosion in there, most of what we're seeing in there is a buildup of, of minerals and such. So a thickening of those walls, we're going to have a bad time with that. What's corrosion itself? Um, when we have an aggressive water, either low pH, high pH, um, oxygenated uh, chemicals in the system, sodium, chlorides, that type of thing, we have corrosion. How do we take care of it? Again, chemicals. All right. So these are a couple of little things that I that I found on on corrosion and what it actually looks like. You can see on that pipe there the damage to that pipe. If you've been in the trade a while, you've seen that. Okay, you've seen that pipe corroded from the outside from the inside out. You don't see it. That pipe might look perfect until the day it breaks open, and then we don't see that anymore. And this is what you see when you start doing a cross section of that. It doesn't take long if we don't treat it correctly for that corrosion to take place. So another factor in taking care of water chemistry is just plain fouling. It's junk, it's mud, it's muck. Um, there's a German word for it that Bill Steiger told me, but I can't remember it, but I'm gonna tap his brain for it because it's a good one. Um, it's just a buildup of dirt and muck on the inside of a boiler passages. This happens to be a big commercial boiler. We can see what's going on with that. That mud and muck does the same thing as scale um, in creating a layer of, of dirt that reduces those heat transfers. That happens to be a Grunfoss 1556 by the looks of it. Um, completely plugged up uh, impeller on that. Pretty hard to move a lot of water through that. And if the other picture beside it of the pipe, that copper tube that's full of mud and muck, if that was in the same system, we can pretty much determine that that system's not going to work well, right? We're not gonna get good heat transfer through our copper tube, whether it be in fin tube, baseboard, whatever. We can't get flow through it. And without flow, we have poor heat transfer. And that pump certainly isn't going to help us out too much either. It's going to spin because one, as long as that thing's spinning, it's not going to seize up. Um, but if we get enough of it in there and it sits for a minute, it can seize right up. These are just a couple of examples of, of a radiator, the basics, right? So we get a radiator is only warm at the top. I know I got good, good flow coming out of my boiler. My circulator is pumping like crazy. I can't get it through my radiator, why not? Well, I might have some sludge in the ball, I might have a bunch of junk in there. It's gonna slow things down, it's gonna stop the transfer of heat in that radiator. If we power flush that, if we clean that system out or keep it clean, we're gonna keep that radiator reasonably even all the way across. So this is a radiator, a panel radiator, showing those cold spots in it. That's a thermal camera, that's a real, a real photograph from a thermal camera, not mine, um, but it just shows us an example of, of what's going on with that. If I had 180 degree water at the top of that, I probably got 65 or 70 at the bottom. Doesn't do a lot of good, and it doesn't give us, as you can see, probably 50% of that radiator is blocked and not heating properly. So we cut the capacity. Let's say that's a 20,000 BTU radiator. Now we've cut that capacity in half to 10,000. Not gonna effectively heat somebody's house. We're gonna put a lot more energy into trying to heat that house and trying to get that efficiency out of that plugged up radiator. So again, we wanna clean it. Um, in our Bosch, in our Green Star stuff, this is just one page of the Boiler Water Chemistry Guidelines. This is a technical service bulletin that you can find on our Bosch Climate site. Um, under technical service bulletins, under boilers, under Green Star, okay? Um, this has all you need to determine what is proper water chemistry for a Green Star boiler. This presentation kind of leans all over the place. I, I'm not necessarily uh, trying to stay on a Green Star, but 
that's our our star boiler right now um, in the high efficiency stuff is a green star boiler these are the things we really want to take care of any system i don't care whose it is i don't care which manufacturer it is they're all susceptible and we have to actually take make sure that we take care of all of those all right so a couple of the guidelines that we have um, these are just steps for commissioning. This is out of the instruction manual. So this is out of the actual install manual um, for Bosch Green Star. We're going to fill the system with clean water. We're going to isolate that boiler. We're going to fill it with fresh water and a boiler cleaner and run between 30 minutes and an hour. We do not want to pump the cleaner through the boiler. It messes with the coating inside the boiler. It takes away from the silicon um, part of the protection part of that boiler system. So we want that isolated with some valves to keep it out of the loop. And we want to circulate water that's good water with a cleaner through the system. Now, a word of caution about cleaning systems. If you have an old, a very old system, that you suspect, let's say it's got a lot of steel pipe in it, that type of thing. Um, radiators, cast iron radiators, steel radiators, that type of thing. If you suspect that that system is in bad condition to begin with, be very careful cleaning it. Sometimes, <laughs> and I've been there, um, you pour in a whole bunch of cleaner, you run it through, a half an hour later, there are leaks all over the place. The customers get kind of antsy about that. They're not very happy with somebody that goes in for a system to change out and give it, get a new efficient boiler. All of a sudden, they're replacing piping and stuff. Be careful with that and, and warn your customer. Let your customer know, hey, you got a really old system here. When I clean this system to make your new boiler run properly, you may have a hard time with this. You may have some problems. We may have to, to fix things here. So just a, a word of caution, if we go in blind and throw a bunch of cleaner in there and all of a sudden it looks like a shower coming out of the second floor, customer's going to be pissed. Um, so try to give them a little fair warning. Try to, try to help that customer along. They'll understand if you explain to them what's going on. Customers are really good about that, but we as technicians, we as business owners need to educate our customer. Uh, there's a lot of guys in the trades that feel that the customer doesn't need to know anything about his system. I can assure you that that is 100% wrong. The more a customer knows about what their system is, the more aware they are that it does require um, some time and it does require some maintenance on a regular basis. If you can educate that customer, you'll do a lot better off. You're going to take all of that water that, that you're in there and it's cleaning it out. You're going to flush it all out. You're going to make sure it's clean. Any traps, sediment traps, filters, anything like that that you had in there before, you're going to take them out, clean them out. All right. If we've got antifreeze in there that's not on this list on the right-hand side of this thing, um, we're going to make sure that it's taken out, flushed out, cleaned. Next, we're going to fill the system with the correct amount of, of fresh water and an inhibitor. We're going to verify with a test, quick test strip after this is circulated for a little while to make sure our pH is where it belongs. All right. Um, if it's not, we're going to add a little more inhibitor. We're going to make, we're going to make sure that that pH is in the, the proper place. Once a year, when you go to clean and service or check up or do a preventive maintenance, whatever you want to call it, on this particular system, you're going to check the pH. If it needs attention, fix it. If it needs a lot of attention, if you find out that, eh, let's say your original fill um, came out at a perfect 7 or 7.2 pH, you get there and the pH is down to 4. you got an issue. There's something going on, so now go find it. Um, and then make sure you treat it correctly. Uh, the antifreeze, the cleaners, all of that, manufacturer's instructions apply. Try not to mix them up. Um, antifreeze ratios count. They make a big difference. Heat transfer doesn't work well with 
with some concentration. So if we go over 50%, usually 50 or 55 on antifreeze, we start affecting our flow and we start affecting our heat transfer. So these are what we have that are approved for Green Star. There's other stuff that may be able to be used as long as it's an aluminum safe. However, we do not, um, we've not tested for it and we don't approve it. And if we find it in there, it's going to void your warranty. Okay. So don't go beyond your approved concentrations. These are the inhibitors that we allow or we have tested with Green Star. Fernox F1, Nalco 77381, and Sentinel X100. All of those are really good corrosion inhibitors. All right, they're going to take care of that pH. They're going to make sure it's between 7 and 8.5. And We're going to use untreated water to fill the system. We're not going to clean that system with TSP. Trisodium phosphate is a very, very effective cleaner. We don't want it in our system. Um, super alkaline, it's going to give us a hard time in that system. And it's what happens with that is um, some of that becomes latent and stays in the water, and it will affect your pH later on. Um, salt bedding type exchangers, water softeners, right? It's a plain Jane water softener. How bad can it be? It's cleaning up the water. It's taking the minerals out. It's all of that. We don't recommend you you, you fill your boiler with a salt bedding type ion exchanged water. The reason is sodium and sodium chlorides. As we exchange through ions, um, hard water, we want to take out those that are attracted to one side of an ion. Sodium is the other side. It's the opposite, right? So we give up a, a grain or a charge of sodium back to the water when we take out calcium, lime scale, that type of thing. Um, you can use it, but be very careful that it's not completely soft and be careful of the sodium content. It's hard to take sodium back out of the water. We can put it in easy, but it's very difficult to get it back out, even with chemicals. If you have a salt bed type and the water is atrocious, it's horrible, and you can't use it, so your pH is too low, hardness is um, way above 7, 8, 10, 12 grains, um, that type of thing. You can use deionized water. You can buy deionized water. You can you can use it in a barrel to bring. Most of the systems are fairly small, so it will work. And in some cases, it's the best um, the best way to handle that. Chlorinated water we can use um, as long as we're below 100 parts per million with chlorine. Once we get over that, we start getting into um, some other chemical issues that that will be corrosive chlorine is a is an oxidizer so it actually makes oxygen work better and it makes oxygen way more corrosive all right so these are some of the other things that we have don't use any of those inhibitors or additives unless they're in a the document um, if you're way outside of the ranges you should be if you guys are in the business of of plumbing, heating, and water conditioning, as I was, this right here is a perfect sales tool to take care of the water treatment on the domestic side of that house. Sell that sell that person a, a proper filtration system that'll take care of it. If we have any type of PEX or oxygen permeable tubing in there, we have to separate that from the boiler. We can't use that if I've got a non-barrier or non-heat PEX. I have to separate that with a heat exchanger. If I if I let that stay in the loops, oxygen will adsorb, and it, so it, oxygen can come into through the pipe into suspension in the water. It's adsorbed, A D S O R B, um, into that system. So I can have a perpetual system that just keeps the oxygen just keeps coming we start to get rid of it it comes back we start to get rid of it it comes back again again and again um, so we have to be careful with that expansion tanks we're going to make sure they're properly sized if they're not properly sized we're going to dump water all the time right we don't want to do that i want to keep water in it i want to keep that down to 
less than 1% and keep that a closed loop system. All right. Don't go too much with flow rates here. If we have too big a pump, we can have some corrosion damage there. Not so prevalent, but if there's a lot of solids or dissolved solids in there, um, a lot of turbidity, we can have some corrosion, in, or not corrosion, but erosion through that. And again, system leaks. We've got to make sure that there are no leaks in that system. Do your tests first, then get your boiler up and running. But make sure your system is okay before you actually um, look at a boiler. It, for me, it, it's as simple as before you take that old boiler out, you isolate everything, you charge it up, whether it's hydrostatic test, uh, whether it's an air test, water test, doesn't matter. Do your diligence, um, test that system to make sure it's tight, to make sure it's not losing anything, especially systems you can't see. Older radiant systems in floor, that type of thing, um, in concrete, make sure that they're not leaking. If they're leaking, your new boiler isn't gonna last. That's the whole purpose of this this thing here, is to make sure that we have a boiler that has good longevity and make sure that our water stays good so that we maintain our efficiencies. Keep them. So that's a picture of a plate heat exchanger. Most of you should know what that is. It's a braised plate, one side of the channel, so to speak, that goes through that or the path that the water goes is the boiler water side. The other side is whatever system side it might be. All right, um, make sure we got the expansion tank again. Um, flow rates, we want to keep those fairly low. Make sure we don't have any system leaks. So now we talk about cleaning it and protecting it, right? This happens to be Fernox. And Fernox has done a lot of work with this. Um, as I mentioned before, Europe has a, a very, very good program making sure that boiler water is clean they're taking care of efficiency right up front right before you even can go out and turn this thing on you're going to make sure that it's going to stay efficient we tend to be in the u.s a little bit lazy we tend to put a boiler on the wall or a boiler on the floor where the old one used to be fill it with water that's in the house because how bad can that be they're drinking it right and walk away it's not the best answer. So in order to keep efficiencies up, this works. Cleaning systems works because it cleans those existing systems out and gets rid of the junk, the corrosion, the sludge, the scale that's in that system before you put a new boiler in it. All right, so there's all kinds of stuff out there um, that takes care of these things. There's all kinds of ways to do it. There's actually pressurized inhibitors now that all you do is tie it into a boiler drain and push the button and it goes in no pumps no mess no fuss super easy this is a little test um or survey that was done in 2007 it was a single family home boston massachusetts low pressure non-condensing cast iron boiler installed in 2007 existing fin tube baseboard they cleaned the system. They used a Fernox PowerFlow flush pump. Um, you could use any flush cart you want. You can make your own flush cart. I own a PowerFlow, a Fernox PowerFlow, one of the early ones. That pump has made me more money and cleaned out more systems than, than I can even imagine. Worth every single dime I paid for it, and it's made itself that money back 20 30 40 times easily maybe more than that okay so this system was cleaned using that pump um they connected supply and return okay they pumped through with f3 cleaner into the existing system connected it right to standard adapters they treated it with f1 fernox afterward these are the results of what was going on before and after. That blue line is how fast that the amount of time that it took to heat that boiler up to those temperatures. We're looking at 92, 94 degrees, something like that. The red one is after. And we can see how much quicker that comes up to temperature 
it also loses temperature quicker. So the heat transfer is much, much greater. Um, I look at it on a chart. I can't really see the results. I mean, I can, but it's hard to kind of comprehend that. Let's look at this. This gives it to us in real time. So the boiler flow temperature to reach 85 before it was cleaned took 16 minutes and eight seconds after cleaning 1228. We had a 22.73% decrease in time. That's an increase in efficiency. It takes 22% less time to reach that temperature. Same with the rest of the, the flow temperatures there. They're all pretty consistent. Between 20 and 23% improvement, it's not a lot. I mean, it's, it's a lot for not a lot of work. That process might have taken an hour and a half. Um, if you're pretty good with, with using these and, you, and you've done it before, um, a half an hour, maybe an hour to get in, properly treat and clean that system and be, and be gone. That's big. That's a lot, of, a, a lot of savings. If you look at 1,000 gallons, it's 220 gallons a year in the savings. That's a lot. So there's that power flow pump. For me, that's it, it's super easy. It's got rollers on it. It's got a dump on it. So you can actually just take the hose, turn it around, turn the valve, and it'll dump it out um, into a safe place wherever you want to put that, whether it's down a, a drain or um, treatment system, whatever it happens to be, to get rid of that water that's in there. A few of the other key components in these systems that we've been talking about are a boiler filter. This is the TF1 Omega. This is a nice filter. They work well. This is a magnetic filter as well as a particle filter. And not to tout only Fernox's product, right? I don't want to kind of lean on one thing. This one happens to be my personal favorite. Kalefi makes one. Webstone makes one. Mag Separator makes one. There's probably 50 of them out there. They're not super expensive. They're probably, I'll bet that Kalefi's 160 bucks something like that. Um, that TF1 is probably 140, 160. And as a, like I said, that's a wild guess on my end. But um, the advantage to it is huge. It's going to help you clean up that water. It's going to help you keep it there. Also, most of these have a port on them, either on the bottom or the top, where you can add chemical. You can test. Makes life pretty easy. On an existing system, if you add this to an existing system, this will pay for itself in a year. There's no doubt in my mind. Um, this and an inhibitor will pay for that call inside of a year in savings. So, and the longevity is even better. So that's that part. We look at air separators as well. Used to be, um, when I started in this, it was an air scoop. And I think Mtrol was one of the few that made an air scoop. There was probably three different manufacturers. It was a chunky piece of cast iron with a funky shape that, that allowed the water to go through. And it had a just a vein, a single straight vein in the middle of it, uh, horizontally, that scooped the water off the top or the air off the top of the water and left it up into a little bit of a chamber that had a high vent in it, right? They work. They work better than nothing. These air separators work way better than that. Um, doesn't matter whose brand you use. It's all personal thing. My personal favorite always used to be Spirovent. It was uh, locally available. Um, Honeywell's got one. Webstone's got one. Watts has got one. Um, they're all over the place. And they're not super expensive. That should go in every single system. It's, it's just the way it ought to be. A uh, couple more slides. These are just fuel cost increase due to the inches of, of scale thickness. So at 0.1 inches of scale, we're up to about an 18% additional fuel cost. This goes back up um, a 16th of an inch. We're 13.6% more fuel. When I get up to a half an inch, 70% of heat loss or efficiency loss. In fuel. It's going to take me 70% more fuel 
to do the same job. So this is my hope that I've brought some awareness to the problems that we have or we can run into with water quality, water chemistry. Um, when you explain those benefits to a customer properly, that customer should easily understand the need for treatment. The selling of that water treatment then becomes very easy for you and it is very profitable. You could make good money selling water treatment and it's selling uh, the customer an efficiency that has a, a good value. It has a good payoff. It's there. It works. Um, the internet is full of good things. Watch out for bad stuff. You know, that's always out there. But if you stick to the, the well-known places, um, Fernox, Romar, Watts, Kalefi, um, the major brands, they'll steer you in the right direction. These are a couple of links that are on here. Um, I'm sure this will get shared around. Um, for whatever it's worth, um, anything that may have been a copyright infringement was not intended. Um, it took a little bit to put this presentation together. It's not something that I had, so I had to find different um, visual aids and that type of thing to help us out. Uh, as always, we have a Bosch Training Academy. These are what it is. It's our Bosch E Academy. There's a couple of slides on here. How to take a quiz on the E Academy, right? Because if you want credit for continuing education credits, you're going to have to go take a 10 question quiz. Um, it's pretty easy. You're going to follow those directions to there. And how do you access, access your certificates? There it is. Okay. So those two slides are involved. The contact information here, 800-283-37800. That's 1-800-BUTERUS, B-U-D-E-R-U-S. Pretty easy one to remember. It's going to get you the tech support. It's going to get you the parts. It's going to get you pretty much everywhere you want to go in Bosch and Buderis. The other ones are the corporate website, the ABC dash, uh, it's Bosch dash ABC partner dot com. That'll get you into part of the training stuff. And then we have training dot Bosch Pro HVAC dot US. All right. We are on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. Um, I don't kind of subscribe to all of them, but I occasionally you'll see me around on on Facebook on my professional page. So from my sidekick and myself, um, that's actually my dog, Bo. He's generally sitting in the office. He's not in here today, but he's usually sitting in the office and it's one of his favorite seats, believe it or not. Uh, he has to go up there. So we throw him on there and he sits there for half an hour. Um, this is us. Thank you very much. And I'll open it up to questions. Anybody's got any questions, I'll try to answer them. If 